Hi, I'm KL Kettle. Welcome to episode 11 of the Book Chain Project. This week, Louis Stowell is interviewing Annalise Avery, whose debut novel, The Night Silver Promise, came out with Scholastic this year. It's um, an epic opening for a trilogy uh, for middle grade, up middle grade, about destiny and dragons. And it's, uh, it's fabulous. And Annalise is also one of my favourite people. So a bit of a spoiler there. Um, join us afterwards and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. One, two, three, four. I'm about to go live with Annalise Avery to discuss the Night Solar Promise. But Instagram is currently telling people that I have started a live video. Oh, there I see people. Excellent. Annalise will be appearing any moment. Technology works, which is always a doubt. Come on, come on, you can do this Instagram. Ta-da! Hey, there you are! <laughs> I have appeared like Mab. It is magic. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, hello, Emma. Vanessa Harbour. Hi, Nessie. Dawn. Folded and sewn, who are not sure what their real name is, but hello. <laughs> and Abby. Hi, Abs. Hello. I like the little wave function. It's very friendly. Oh, where's the wave function? So who actually is the Book Chain Project, if, if it's like this mysterious force? <laughs> or should well, we never I, find out? <laughs> oh, OK, we won't say that. I was going to say, I think, it, I think it's like the mysterious force that is Kitty Kettle, but... Oh, yeah, it probably is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, um, I've had jury rigged this system where I basically put my phone on a blanket, so hopefully it won't fall over, but excuse me while I'm, if I'm fiddling. Uh, my phone is currently sitting on my iPad um, holder on top oh. of my MacBook, which then has my uh, a pot of ink on top of it, and then oh. my j two journals. So what then... you're saying could all go horribly wrong. <laughs> it could, as long as I don't wiggle anything, it will. Be yeah, fine. no wiggling. Okay, we're going to stay really still for this interview. Um, so I mean, I can give a few minutes. I won't. I won't give too too long for people. Let's get let's get going. Let's get um, it's so being recorded, I'm, so um, yes, that is back. true. That is true. So they can find out later. Um, so I'm delighted to be interviewing Annalise today about the Night Silver Promise, her middle grade debut, which is fantastic. Do you happen to have a copy? Because I don't have a finished copy. I've just got a proof. Woo! There it is. Um, and um, yes, a wonderful fantasy adventure full of heart and fantastic world building and exciting action and just so much packed into, well, not, not a little book, but a, a medium book, you know, it's, it feels... It's, 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 it's chunky enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, chunky enough. <laughs> it's a whole journey and there will be more, I believe. Book yes, um, book two, I've, I've sent my first draft to uh, to my editor last week my the lovely Yaz so um, just waiting for some feedback which mm, is always, always a scary always time fun, the waiting isn't it the waiting is fun yeah <laughs> <laughs> the waiting is fun will they be okay with the things that I've done this is the Ooh. thing isn't it it's have like, you killed <gasps> everyone sorry have you killed everyone not everyone <laughs> <laughs> Only slight yeah. killing. Okay, good. Yeah, um, that's, yeah, a bit like you know, the light maiming, slight killing, that kind of thing. Just a pinky. Um, <laughs> cool. So I have questions. So many questions um, for you. Starting off with, um, so the world building in this book is fantastic. It's really kind of fully realised, kind of complex society with all kinds of like you know, theology behind it, um, which I was I always applaud when there's when you've got the theology too. Um so I'd love to know like how did you go about shaping this world and like why clockwork, why dragons, um what drew the ideas, what you know, what how did it all come together in your mind? I won't ask you where your idea came from, but just how did it merge in your brain? Um so I I think that as writers we collect ideas, 
we collect mm. them as we're going um going around and i like to think of them like um a kind of planetary nebula mm. so so the idea or like a nebula before before the the star is formed so yeah, you yeah. have this nebula of ideas and then you get like there's one idea that you know through through the process of brownie in motion just collides with all the other ideas and pff, you get that you get that oh, moment you know that oh, yeah. hang on hang on hang on um and that's like your aha moment your your son um and then all of the other di ideas kind of drift around in your what's now formed your accretion disc um creating little planetismals that then bash into each other to create your characters that are orbiting the sun of this idea and then the moons and the ring systems and all of the things that go along to make your story universe yeah. um so i had lots of different ideas that were bashing about in my head and um i don't i don't remember the aha moment but i remember it was a nanowrimo and i sat down to write a totally different book mm. and um my eldest daughter liberty she's um very good at making her own clothes and things and she came down dressed in this kind of steampunky kind of uh, outfit and I was like oh perhaps I'll write something totally different yeah and, and so I started writing what was the first first version of the uh the night silver promise which was then called the invention of night and it was like 120,000 words long and it was because I'm a pantser it was me telling myself the story Mm. for 120,000 words um but the idea of the clockwork universe came because I'm quite interested in astronomy and in the 13th century there was this scholarly monk uh called uh John John of Sacrobosco uh he then became known as like John of Hollywood and okay. <laughs> which is like a cool name <laughs> and he had this theory um that he he taught and it was the prevalent theory for like 300 years uh the idea of the world machine and that the universe was a you know clockwork mechanism yeah, yeah. and you, the precise motion of the solar system um could be measured and and it's something that newton talked about a bit and and it also branched off into this idea of mechanical philosophy as well mm. so there's like a whole branch of philosophy called mechanical philosophy where you know the idea of fate and everything is preordained and 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 the idea of having a a kind of creator who set things up and then left mm. and, yeah, so so, yeah. I'm pretty sure I had a whole philosophy class on the watchmaker and how he's just sort of left us to it and just not it's not a nice guy why would he leave us just um not interested at all <laughs> um so yeah so that's where the idea of the chief designer came from creating mm. this universe um and um the idea of destiny and the the stars kind of mimic you know holding the your destiny and your fate came later it was like one of the very last world building things that slotted into place and it started that mostly to troll astronomers because they're so fed up of being called astrologers <laughs> that, is, that is where it came from so i founded an astronomical society in like 2013 and um they hate being amateur astronomers any kind of astronomers hate being yeah. called astrologers and i was just like oh, i'm just gonna mess with them um so did it, yeah like, oh, that's fun it made perfect sense it was like well if you totally believe that you are in the clockwork universe then yeah. you believe that well also, astrology that would work if it was a clockwork universe that determined your fate because obviously that's you know the point Pretty of clockwork. Okay. yeah yeah um and going a bit more into the detail of the world building, I was really interested in the idea of being dragon touched and where that came from. Um, so the dragon touch kind of turned up the same time as the dragons did. And um, I remember quite vividly when they turned up, I was washing up um, and, and I was like, oh, OK, so we've got this clockwork mechanism and we've got the unseen tracks of, of the celestial mechanism and I'm going to need something really hot to fire to, you know, to create uh, the, the fire, to fuse the atoms together of the exotic particles that I've made up. Um, mm. And I was like, okay, dragons, like dragon breath could be dragon really, 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 really hot. So of course it, it just seemed like a very natural um evolutionary process to have dragons mm. that worked with the chief designer to create uh, the universe and then um 
and then as I was washing up, I was thinking about um, cowpox. I don't know why I just was. And um, so the idea of, of when, um, when milkmaids spent a lot of time with uh, cows, they got cowpox. And then that meant that they were immune to smallpox. So there was like a transition of genes from the cow, you know, from the infected cow yeah, yeah. to, to the humans. Um, and I thought, okay, so if these women spend an awful lot of time with dragons, perhaps there's yeah. some kind of transference that's going on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's when dragon touch evolved yeah. from the idea that through that close contact with the dragons, they caught something that then changed their genetic structure in yeah. some way. Yeah. Oh, I like it. I, um, I, I obviously relate everything back to Buffy and there's an episode where she gets something on her skin and she's going to develop an aspect of the demon and she keeps thinking the aspect is going to be, you know, a physical aspect that a boy demon might have, but it turns out it's being psychic. Um, ah. There's a Buffy episode for literally everything. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I've, I've never watched Buffy. <laughs> I've no Which idea. My if friend Danny to... Edwards is always very, very angry about i should really yeah. watch Buffy. although we did you, get... might, you might have missed a moment i don't know but you never know um yeah for debbie's birthday we got spike to do her a little cameo promo and it was that's fabulous. pretty good we like that <laughs> um cool so so we've got this world um and i mean in terms of the themes of the story like what what do you see as like the overriding theme of the story um so I think that in the first book, the kind of the theme is that you are in control of your destiny. Yeah. You, know? you, you are in control of the things that happen to you and you have a certain amount of power that you can move within. Even if you yeah. know that something is going to happen or that there's like things that are in place within the structure and the hi you know, hierarchy of living, um, mm. you still have power within that structure yeah. through the choices that you make. So I think book one is about realising that you have power and that you have the power to make choice. And then book two is kind of about once you've made those choices, you need to take responsibility for any repercussions Ooh, that happen. That. Consequences are fun. Consequences are terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to read about the terrifying to happen to you. Yes. Um, so let's talk process. So you've already said you're a pantser. Um, so like, how do you, you know, I mean, you've just written book two. So how did you sit down to write book two? Was it literally just blur and then? And yeah, so I, I, I usually have these kind of, I, I was a lot less of a pantser with book two because of time constraints. So, um, but I always have these kind of moments in my head that, that I'm aiming towards. So mm. it's like, this is, I have a very clear image of what happens at the end and usually a very clear image of what happens at the midpoint and then some different points in between. And then mm. I let myself get there. I let myself kind of go towards those places and sometimes yeah. really exciting, interesting things happen along the way. And I have to decide how much I want to explore that. There was something really exciting that happened in book two. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. So we definitely, you know, I definitely embraced that. But I didn't know it was going to happen before I sat down and mm. wrote book two. But there were some things that I definitely knew happened. Um, and I wrote out a sequence for book two. So I wrote mm. the end first. And then I wrote the things that I was excited about. So I wrote the midpoint before I'd written the beginning right. and then kind of went, worked out how I was going to get from the midpoint to the end. I knew obviously where my beginning was because we have the end of book one. So yeah, then it was working handy. out how I got from the end of book one to the midpoint and then mm. just writing the things that most excited me that day rather yeah, than yeah. Um, writing it linearly. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so it was a slightly different process uh, doing book two. Mm. But usually what I do is I do a draft and then I edit that draft. And when I can't edit it anymore, I start with the blank page and write the story again. Yeah. And then edit it again. And then... Do so you the completely scrap the first one? Yes. So, uh, well, completely scrap the first one, completely scrap the second one. It will get scrapped until it is ready. Because yeah. I find that um, to, keep, to keep editing a draft 
it feels dirty to me after a while <laughs> there's, like, there's so many things that are left in it and it's like oh no whereas if I scrap it all of the good bits stay in my sieve you know right and all of the all of the bits that aren't so exciting that I'm not as connected to will fall through the sieve oh, and awesome. and I find that a good process for getting something that's very uh, so you someone that naturally has quite a good memory would you say yeah not for not for like places and people and things but no, no, story. Not for like, stuff. <laughs> like yeah yeah I'm, good at, I'm um, good at remembering story and I'm good at remembering all the things my kids do right uh, <laughs> all the bad things <laughs> and all the good things they get awesome points for good things although they're yeah. they're old so like there's a lot less awesome points being given out because oh sad yeah. You should still get awesome points all your life, you know? Oh, they definitely get awesome points. The other day, Oak got one. I was like, get an awesome point. And he was like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, brilliant. Um, so, okay, so writing process. So you, you completely jumped the drafts, which is a terrifying idea to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. it's not for everyone. I'm not suggesting No, no, it's a very bold throw, move. I like it. I, I really thing. admire it. It just sounds but... terrifying. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, Laura. Saying, um, you deserve all the awesome points yourself. Ah, oh, thanks, Laura. <laughs> Back at you. <ya. laughs> um, and yeah, so obviously we've got you know we've got writing process, but there's another process at work here, which is the publishing process, which is you know the worm that swallows us all that we can't control. But um, everyone is always very curious about how you got to where you are now. So if you talk us through a bit, like how you got from whatever your first idea was to published and doing instagram yeah. live <laughs> so it definitely wasn't a quick process um so i think i first had the idea for for the book about five six years ago um yeah, quick. <laughs> so, super quick and and i knew that i wasn't so I, I wasn't there as a writer i needed to work on my craft and thing mm. and you know become better so um so when I very first started, I was uh, teaching creative writing in various schools and I was homeschooling my kids. And then um, I joined the Golden Egg Academy and started working on my craft. And then I became a library manager and um, I did a master's degree in creative writing. And I just learned, you know, read lots of stories, read lots of books about how to craft a really good story and, um, and learned a bit about, you know, what it is to be a writer and to, mm. and to feel uncomfortable and to write the things that make you excited but also make you a little bit scared mm. you know, when you're like I don't know if I can do this justice but yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try I'm gonna try yeah. my hardest um so I entered Undiscovered Voices and that was like the big what is Undiscovered point. Voices? Sorry, I haven't, I'm not aware of this. What, what is it exactly? Uh, okay, so Undiscovered Voices. If you are a member of Scooby, every two years, uh, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators in the UK run a competition called Undiscovered Voices. So um, you have to be a member to enter the competition. Mm. You enter your first 4,000 words of your manuscript, a 75-word synopsis, which is just like horrible. Like... 75 words that's like a scrap um, line <laughs> and then um and then you wait and you wait to hear if you've been shortlisted uh, long listed yeah um and and the wonderful thing about undiscovered voices is the the opportunity that it gives you i'm gonna see if i've got my no i don't um but they they so they the the books the manuscripts that get shortlisted mm are the 4,000 words are produced in a book and as an ebook online and mm. that book is sent to agents and publishers mm. and you get a mentor who helps you through that process mm. and you get a lovely party to go to in London. Um, oh, those parties. Yeah, it's always good to have a party. Uh, we had our party just at the start of, like, when everybody was going, ooh, there's this funny flu thing going around. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, so it was literally just as as coronavirus was the last party was yeah it was happening, um, and 
and what's lovely about Undiscovered Voices that I found is that the 12 of us, the 12 finalists from 2020, we've formed such a lovely close-knit group and we meet mm. like once a month on Zoom and we really support each other. And the team at Undiscovered Voices, who's led by um, Sarah Grant, is just amazing. They mm. are so, so helpful and so um, proactive at helping you to get in touch with agents uh, and agents instead of you sending out your manuscript agents come and ask you for it because Ooh, that's nice which is very nice because <laughs> they've read it in the anthology and if yeah, they're yeah. interested then they get in touch with you so um yeah I'm very civilized i approve of that it's not it's such a <laughs> lovely um it's a lovely way to do it because you do feel very supported hmm. you know, from the Undiscovered Voices team. And um, Undiscovered Voices 2022 is opening for submissions this summer. So Ooh. anybody who's a member of Scooby um, and has a manuscript that they feel is in good shape and ready for it uh, should definitely take advantage of that opportunity. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, awesome. And, and then, so you got Undiscovered Voices, then what? Oh, so um, <laughs> off the back of Undiscovered Voices, I met Helen, my agent, Helen Boyle from Pink mm -hmm. Lovely she Helen. She's just the most amazing person in the world. And uh, we met each other just before the pandemic. Um, and that's the one and only in life meeting that we've had. Yeah. <laughs> but we are planning on hopefully at some point meeting up and going stationary shopping because we both love stationary. Oh, nice. um, so yeah so I met Helen and then we did a little bit of work on the manuscript there was one character that that she made me make nicer because they Ooh, were a bit who was that Odelia was a slightly harsh to Corbett oh, really <laughs> in that draft uh so we made her a little bit um, softer around the edges yeah. especially towards Corbett um and then we sent it out and and Scholastic came back with a preempt, and first of all, Helen had to explain to me what a preempt was, and then, um, yeah, and then I met with Yaz and uh, so, um, my lovely editor, Yasmin Morrissey, and Lauren Fortune, and um, and I was overjoyed to, to sign yeah. Scholastic. So, oh, you got a yay from Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it is exciting. I was, I think, you know, um. One of those things that's very easy to do as a writer is not really stop and feel grateful for the good stuff that's happened. Just like, oh no, will it sell? Or, oh no, will X happen next? And so I think we should take a moment and say, this is a pretty amazing achievement and also an amazing book. Ah, oh, thank you. And I think also it's finding joy in the process, isn't it? Mm. It's like, because there's so much of it that you, there's a lot of rewriting that happens and obviously a lot mm. of thinking. And and I just, um, so I'm, I, I love that collaborative element of working with mm. my editor because it's like, I've made the story as best as I can, you know, as shiny as I can do it. Yeah, now yeah. we're going to have a chat and we're going to bounce ideas off and then it's going to, we're going to shine it together. We're going to yeah, yeah. you know, polish it up and make it more shiny and richer and deeper. Mm. And, um, and I really look forward to that part mm. of the process of... Um, of letting somebody else in yeah um, vibing off their energy <laughs> yeah no, it like is a writing great. vampire yeah <laughs> <laughs> just here to eat the editors really you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with a nice chianti um <laughs> so i have a question for you if a bunch of stars appeared on your wrist tomorrow and revealing your destiny what would it say Oh, so I think it firstly say that I'm destined to always be untidy because I am a slightly untidy person. Um, but I live in a house full of people that have tidy up OCD, which is oh right. Well, do they just put tidy up after you then? Um, they do not come in my study. Like uh. they, they just my other half. Bless him. He's like, I put some post in your study, and I'm not going in there again. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so they're all, they're all very tidy, neat freaks, and yeah. I am not. And I think it would probably also say that I'm um, destined for my children always to think that I am a mega nerd. Um, <laughs> and to never be able to cook Yorkshire puddings. Because really? Because I've tried and I've tried, but I just cannot. I don't know. what They just turn out like a a solid block of spongy Oh. mixture it just never works it's sad. Oh, well, i feel like you can take that pain and turn it into art i could good disappointment yeah. 
just use it for fuel. I'll show you. My I may not be able to do this, but I can write books. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so a philosophical one next. Um, you're obviously, writing about a world that has kind of predestination in it. But what what do you personally think about fate? Um, like what what drew you? I mean, obviously, there is the kind of backstory of the kind of astronomical origins of this. But what kind of drew you emotionally to writing a story about fate? Um. I think fate is quite a dangerous thing to have mm. because um, I think you can you can put limitations on yourself and go oh it's just my fate not to do that mm. um, and and I think that you should well personally I think you should always strive towards your happiness and your joy mm. um, and if there are barriers in the way then you should try to overcome them if it's a thing that you really want the thing that mm. you really want to to be doing or you want to have in your life you should try to overcome them um and i think that if there is if everything is predestined like we don't know if it is we don't know if it isn't mm. so the only thing you can do is like work towards your happiness and if you get to the end and somebody says to you well actually that's exactly how we planned it mm. then you don't know that that's fine yeah. but if you stop doing things because you believe that somebody has got a different plan for you yeah that's entirely different that's yeah. you limiting yourself because you believe that somebody else has has something planned for you and you are imposing that upon you yeah um, in, a, in a in a way that does not bring joy <laughs> no i think joy is a very good motivator i appreciate i, I like that um so um, are there any other themes apart from fate that you find yourself kind of coming back to in your writing like over time yeah I often write about death death, so, death. but I think that's because I'm quite um I'm, te I'm I am terrified of death you know yeah it's, it's the one big thing isn't it it's the one thing that happens to us all it's the one thing that we don't really talk about as a society mm. um and it's uh, as well as birth it's the one thing that we all share yeah yeah in common um and and i think it's not necessarily the act of dying that i'm scared of it's it's what i'm leaving behind because yeah i have i have a lot of richness in my life and mm. a lot of people that i love and and so it's not necessarily what i'm moving towards it's mm. what i'm moving away from yeah so when you say you want to write about death in a way you're writing about love because it is about yeah. that what what you'd be losing the things that um. keep us yeah yeah so not like morbid geth, goth death it's more you know please don't die <laughs> yes <laughs> it's yeah. more wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to worry about that whole death thing yeah. and and we could we could just be happy forever. Yeah. that'd be beautiful i love that um so on the on the love ish topic i'm gonna make i'm trying to do a segue between each question here i like this yeah, yeah. um <laughs> on the topic of love what's your approach to writing about relationships because you obviously got like a sibling relationship that's really core to the book um so yeah i'd love to know kind of how how you kind of write those bonds between people those tensions between people yeah Where that so, comes from in you. so in the book the the relationship between dax and uh and paisley started off as um a reflection of the relationship between my eldest daughter liberty and my son oak um hmm because they have this kind of, especially when Oak was little. So Liberty was five when Oak was born and mm. she absolutely doted on him. You know, mm. She would do absolutely anything for him until it got to the point that he was a, a very annoying toddler. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then that the kind of changed, their relationship dynamic changed. Mm. Um, but I'm very lucky that I've got three children. Um, so Crystal, Liberty and Oak, they get on really well. They, you know, at which they have spent an awful lot of time together being siblings mm. as they are all homeschooled. Mm. Um, so, so it's quite surprising that they get on as well as they do. <laughs> um, but definitely Liberty and, and Oak were, were the foundation for that relationship. And obviously mm. it, it evolved as Paisley and Dax evolved into being uh, their own distinct people. And Odelia yeah. was originally based on my younger daughter, Crystal. Um, mm. She is the solid rock mm. you know she's the sticky glue um mm -hmm. and yeah so odelia definitely started off as being um 
a reflection of Crystal and then she she grew into her own. So, mm. so definitely those three relationships, they started off as something um, that I had anchor points for. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. I am, um, and I'm, I'm an only child, so I always find kind of the sibling thing quite interesting. I never really write about siblings because I wouldn't know. But um, <laughs> but I do find those kind of sibling-like relationships quite e- interesting, where you're kind of, I guess anyone that you're thrown together with and you didn't have a choice about is is quite interesting. Um, and I feel like in a in a fated world, that's especially relevant because obviously you're kind of that's another thing that the stars have decided for you, which you know, which mother you all came out of. <laughs> Indeed. And there is that thought, um, I know that I've, I've read lots of different things and I remember reading something that said that, uh, you know, your soul gets to pick the the life that you have. So essentially you're, you're picking your, your parents and your life experience before you've, before you've arrived, which again is another really interesting kind of concept to, to think about. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I like to do in my, in my own life every now and again is I have a little stop and I think, am I, I, like if at the moment of my death I get reborn into this life mm. I have to start at the very beginning a bit like me redrafting my book um, <laughs> and and I have to live exactly the same life would I be all right with that would I yeah. be okay with putting up with all of the rubbish in order to get all of the good mm. and, and luckily the answer is always yes but I feel that if at any point it was well no actually this rubbish is yeah, rubbish, yeah. then that's a very good catalyst for change Hmm. Oh, interesting. I I never really step back, so this is <laughs> this is kind of interesting. <laughs> I spend far too much time thinking. Right. Then. I have my nose pressed against the glass. So I'm in there. Um. <laughs> so um. Okay. So we've got love. We've got relationships. We've got fate. Um. So, I mean. So one of the things we were saying earlier is that you you sort of in your learning process as a writer there was a lot of reading. Um, so have you got any favourite group um, books for this age group, for the kind of 8 to 12, um, whether it's old, you know, from your own childhood or modern or um, any that you felt like you yeah. learned from? So when I was a kid, I didn't read very much fiction. I read mm. lots of non-fiction. Um, I think the closest thing I got to reading like fiction was was probably myth stories. So mm. I liked reading all of the Greek myths and, and Norse myths. Uh, but we it's a common it's a common joke in my family. We had a set of um, Claxton's encyclopedias, and Annalise read them. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I remember collecting uh, Quest magazine as a child when I grew up, and uh, Quest magazine was like a, a, a uh, a fortnightly magazine that came in a sleeve and you had pages that had different sections in it so there were like pages that told you things about the natural world about space about new technology um you know all of these different subject areas so there's one of them one of those ones where you had like a folder that you put together yes, in. and then you had a folder yeah. that you put together and then it also had like a big poster that came with it mm-hmm. and also some kind of crafting activity that you could mm-hmm, do mm-hmm. um and i adored that as a child so um but i remember when i when i first decided that i that i wanted to write and i wanted to write for mm. children i was working for um english heritage and i was working in a castle a framingham oh. castle so it's the castle that ed sheeran sings about castle on the hill and um and i was writing different things and then i read um philip Pullman's his dark materials and mm-hmm. i hadn't read it before uh because you know i was too old by the time it came out and, mm. and it had passed me by and i remember reading it and thinking this is the type of thing that that i want to write you know mm. something that's that doesn't talk down to my reader doesn't um assume that that that, that they are that you know that they are less um and just tells them how it is and allows them to find their way. Like just mm. trusts them, trusts the reader to, if you don't understand this, you're, you're going to find it out because, yeah, yeah, you know, this is part of the, part of the un, unspoken um, contract that we are entering into. Yeah. Uh, and the contract goes a bit like, um, I'm going to tell you some things. I'm going to tell you some things that are true and some things that aren't. And um, you're going to come with me. And we're going to have a good time. And at the end, I'm going to give you a gift. You might like the gift. And you so what's the gift? Lost. The gift is the ending. 
Ah. So the ending is always the gift. <laughs> and it's and it's the gift that you give your reader for for for, for coming on the journey. You know? mm-hmm. And that gift might be anticipation of what's to come. It yeah. might be um the closure of of an arc. Mm. Um, but it's always something that they take away with them mm. and that they can meditate on and think about. I think mm. um so for me, one of the one of the books that's given me the biggest gift is Patrick Ness's A Monster Calls. I feel oh. like that book destroyed me as a person and yeah. then built me up as a much better one. Um, and that was just such a wonderful gift to receive as a reader. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's lots of books that, that I love. And so um, When You Meet Me by um, Rebecca Stead. I love that book. I haven't read that. I haven't, oh, it's it's very good um mm. the giver by lois lowry Love the giver. Yeah, no, never read that one i just i didn't read any american stuff growing up really um i've only really read you know i've read a lot of contemporary american stuff but not the older kids stuff really so my wife's very good every now and then she'll mention a book i was like never read it <laughs> the giver is um is a book that i give to people for their birthdays <laughs> is it, I, I don't know i know nothing about this book so in my head i'm assuming it's about it's like um uh, never let me go about giving up body parts but is that not true <laughs> no no it's um so the giver is is set in a um in a kind of future a future place the future mm. uh, you know our future that is very different and very regulated so everything is uh, emotions are regulated mm. um development is regulated and um within the society that Jonas the the main character lives in um within the society that he lives in there is a person called the receiver of memories mm-hmm. and the receiver of memories receives from the giver all of the memories of the past time so how the world used to be um and uh, there's a ceremony every year there's a ceremony of people as they get older they take on mm. different functions and different roles within the society mm. and um jonas is he becomes the the, the receiver of memories and it's mm. how he how he deals with that and how by oh, receiving great. Those I'm memories, it. <laughs> it's brilliant it's yeah. a brilliant <laughs> brilliant book and it's just uh it's the first in a in a quadrilogy um but the other books are connected but you do, but I'll stand alone. Yeah. So, yeah, I so definitely I think recommend you it. Come at, you come at writing it with a really interesting perspective then, having not really read much children's fiction as a child, but non-fiction instead, and then sort of coming to the children's fiction later as an adult for, from a craft perspective almost, but but also to as a reader. Yeah, um, and also my, my children are huge fiction readers hmm. rather than non-fiction readers so it was kind of me exploring fiction whilst whilst they were exploring it at the same yeah. time um so that was a re- that was really interesting that we were both some texts we were both coming to them at the same yeah. time and seeing their reaction to it and mm. then seeing my re- reaction to it and i think that made me realize that when i write i'd like to have the layers so there are layers of of, of um I, I don't know Lay, layers of um i was gonna say perception but i don't think that's the right word so basically Weirdly, you know, that was the word i was thinking of so, <laughs> so maybe that on. is the right word <laughs> well, I think of, you're perceiving different layers of the story if you're a different reader yeah and you're bringing all of your life experience to to, mm. to that uh, to that story in that thread and you know all of the life experience that you have as an eight-year-old as a nine-year-old is 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 in no way small or diminished in comparison to the life experience that you bring as an adult there's mm-hmm. you know they they're just different and yeah. it's and it's looking at at the story through those lenses mm. and through what's important to each of those readers and what they're yeah. going to pick up on and what they're not so often you know that reading experience is shared in some way whether it's you know reading it as a bedtime story or even just you know the young reader telling the adult reader what they're reading at the moment and you know i've had you know plenty of children tell me the story they're reading and it's and it when i've and i realized i've actually read that book and it's nothing like i my experience at all you know it's like a completely different story which is wonderful yeah one of my favorite things about being a librarian was when all the children come in and they're like, what book should I read? And getting to recommend 
books to them and mm. then getting and then then coming back and looking for me and being like I read this and I really like this bit and this bit and this bit and then mm. choosing books together and quite often when I had adults kind of like approach me and ask for a book to read I'd find out what kind of books they like I'd give them a couple of selections from the adult section and then just whip them around to the children's section and go <laughs> And I think you'd like this one too. Yeah. And sometimes I'd find them at the self-service where they'd abandoned them. And sometimes they'd come back and go, I loved that book and I need to yeah. read more children's books. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I'm realising we're rather over time. So I'm yeah. going to pick out of my final questions. Um, well, we've got a little extra later, so that's fine. Um, one, one last question. So... Um, if you had to write a spin-off involving one side character from Night's Silver Promise, which side character would you pick? Um, so there's a character really early on in the book. Um, it's in chapter two. And she is the shop girl who is captured by the Ooh, men yeah, at the yard. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I know what her name is and I know exactly why, you know, what she was doing before they captured yeah. her and I know what happens to her afterwards and and I, I think I'd like to write her story mm. um, but I'd also love to have a graphic novel exploring Odelia's story as well mm. you know and um, we're getting and, a yes a strong yes from the audience from Vanessa yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so yeah so I think and, I think the world is big enough to you to, to branch out in different directions mm. and um and it's interesting and complex enough to to be fresh at mm. the things that we're seeing uh, but we're just seeing what happens yeah and in this graphic novel what would be like your dream art style oh um like quite well, realistic think, painterly or well i think my, my daughter uh, crystal she she absolutely loves uh, graphic novels and and she adores manga so she'd be like come on mum tokyo girl <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i think it would have to be something that's slight slightly very rich and yeah. and i love limited palettes so um mm, I, I, I love watching um oh think Annalise what's the director called um the guy who did the Royal Tenenbaums and oh yeah yes uh, Wes Anderson I love his yeah. I love his color scheme I love the limited palette that he uses with within the colors so I'd, I'd really I'd, I'd, I'd want them to explore that kind of thing the idea of the, yeah. the different colors in different places denoting different things and yeah. um yeah yeah oh wonderful um it's been so lovely chatting to you um, Likewise. <laughs> and I will be saving this so um, people can watch it back. Um, we've got a yes, Wes from Laura. <laughs> yes, Wes Anderson. He's awesome. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So lovely to chat. And your book is amazing. If anyone has not yet read it, why haven't you read it yet? Go and read it now. Why are you And here? it's only 99 pence on Kindle just Ooh. for today. Oh, excellent. Uh, get get, get it's involved. It's Kindle daily deal. So. Well, definitely spread the word about that to anyone that's not read it. Um, but uh, and thanks for watching, guys, and um, to the people watching this in the future. Um, I wonder what Cummings has said by now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, it's been, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you. And I, I love being able to find out more about a book from the person who wrote it, and also about what what's not in the book and what's behind it. And um, so, thank you. Oh, it was been a joy, and you're most welcome. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I will turn off and say goodbye. Yeah, thanks everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Grady, Ben and Lizzie survived Savage Island, but can they survive Cruel Castle and take down Marcus Gold in the process? They're surrounded by psychopaths and lethal traps, but now they've got a few tricks of their own. Cruel Castle by Bryony Pierce out in September 2021. Hello, so welcome to the green room after the Instagram. Um, it's very nice to see you. Um, and so I know we had a bonus question that we didn't manage to fit into the um, into the Instagram. And also if there was anything else you didn't manage to say that we could add to the green room gang.
Um, so the question that we wanted to add was from Gav Hetherington, which was, forgive me if I get the wording wrong, um, what's your proudest author moment so far? Um, so there have been a few uh, proud author moments, like you know, seeing the book, uh, yeah. that kind, you know, and then seeing the book in a shop. Uh, yeah. Mostly it revolves around looking at the book with my eyeballs. <laughs> um, <laughs> holding the book. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't licked it yet. No, no. I'm not quite sure that the foil is up to being licked. Um, um, but what I shall show you one of my my proud moments. So, um, a lovely young lady called Daisy uh, drew me a very beautiful picture of Paisley. Uh, it's really good. It looks like she's kind of rushing off to save her brother. Yeah. Um, and she also sent me a little gift. So Daisy is um, when I was with the Golden Egg Academy, my editor was uh, Mickey Marshall and Daisy is Mickey's daughter. And uh, so uh, Daisy read um, the proof copy of uh, oh, lovely. of the Night's Elf Promise. So she sent me a, a little, a beautiful little necklace of a dragon. Oh. And she wrote me this slightly threatening note. <laughs> which is adorable. Uh, dear Annalise, I loved Night Silver Promise. I loved Paisley, but Odelia is my favourite character. Team Odelia. Um, I, mean, I gave you this present because I thought it was something that Paisley would wear. Good luck with your second book. P.S. Don't kill off Odelia. Please, please, please. <laughs> Otherwise, I might not speak again from Daisy. And then in brackets, also, I might not speak to you, or I might not speak ever again. I think ever again. Like, so we're going vow of silence if Adelia dies. Yeah, if Adelia dies. And then after her name, she's put also known as danger. So I feel like that's... Okay, this is like, very threatening. <laughs> yes. And I feel like if that's the kind of, um, you know, readers that I've got, yay. Brilliant. A few Loving that passion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and I think it really goes to show that um a lot of this kind of talking down to readers and wrapping them in cotton wool is just silly because actually they've got murder in their hearts and they're plotting your death so it's they can handle it so they can handle long words and a bit of stabbing definitely and and I think you know they enjoy that challenge they enjoy mm. the challenge of, of 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 feeling um trusted with yeah with being able to handle a story that's maybe a little bit bigger um, yeah. and a little bit more complex. And, yeah. and I think it gives them, I know for me, like it gives me joy when I, when I work something out in a story and, yeah, I'm, yeah. and I'm like, oh, and I'm there with it and I'm in the action and I'm puzzling it through. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, that was a very proud moment. Yeah, well, that is, that is a good moment. I, I think fan art is the greatest thing, you know, it's um, definitely. Beautiful. Have you got really good like that? <laughs> and and you you drew me some wonderful fan art of Odelia. I did, yeah. Just after when I just after I'd read it. Um I didn't like look back and check at the description, so I don't think I physically got her right, but hopefully I got something spiritual about You definitely her. captured her energy <laughs> and yeah. mm -hmm. her her feistiness. Um yeah. yeah, that was definitely on show. No, <laughs> it's brilliant. And so you've just finished book two, your cousin just drafted it. Yeah, so I've, I've just sent it off to um, to my editor. So we're just, yeah. I'm just waiting to to hear back from her, and then I will, with my crazy process, I will start with a blank sheet and start writing wow. again. I'm still, I'm still really reeling from that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, like I said, it's not for everyone, but it no, definitely, no. definitely works for me. And and I know a couple of it's people. It's like do. the method acting of writing or something. It's just that very extreme approach, you know. I like it though. I like it. Yeah. Um, it, it, it does feel extreme, but I think every time I rewrite it, I'm feeling like the story is a lot more solid. It's a lot more connected. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's that sieve, the idea of the sieve and all of the, yeah. all of the, and it's quite, uh, quite strange because sometimes I'll, because I'll, I'll print out the document, I'll go through everything i'll write editorial notes um hmm. and then i won't look at them when i'm rewriting um, yeah but occasionally i have 
uh, like when I finished writing, I'll go back just to check that I got everything that I wanted. And mm. the exact same phrasing that I've written in my longhand notes will be there in the typed yeah. version, even though I wasn't, you know, transcribing it. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. So it's yeah. quite amazing what your brain holds on to, how it. Yeah, because um, I feel if I did that, I'd just end up writing a completely different book, which would be fine. But it wouldn't like I, I would in no way capture anything from the original draft. It'd just be a bunch of completely different stuff. Um, I don't think my brain holds on to anything. So um, yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. Um, there was obviously we kind of you know talks a lot, which is great. Um, so I, there was a few questions I didn't actually manage to get to. Well, um, I do, do you want to but, fire those off now? I mean, just quickly, um, yeah, it just, it's just a couple. Um, one was um, obviously did a lot of world building. Was there anything you had to leave out from the final book that you like built but never got to? Like you didn't, it wasn't even part of this, it wasn't relevant to the story. So you just kind of didn't include it, but you, but you imagined it. Yeah, so we had lots of, um, like in my first draft, there was uh, a lot more with George. So, mm. and, and uh, the, the King's men. So his knights and mm. how that all fitted together and in book two I've been able to to use that because we, mm. we spend a bit more time with George we get to understand some of um the, some of the the kind of interplays that are happening around the George and although he's like the head of the empire there's the there are these people moving around him who are also like influencing him and obviously he's got his stars as well that he needs to um needs to live by um mm. so that was really cool thinking of all of the swanky costumes for the different orders <laughs> of knights to wear <laughs> yeah. uh you know all of the different color schemes what their symbols are uh what right. their mottos are and some of this you know like their mottos and things that's not in book two but it's yeah. all part of that iceberg the iceberg of yeah writing. yeah no, the things that you know that yeah um, and then you can always like drop tiny references to them to amuse yourself, which is always fun. Um, and um, so the other one that I didn't manage to ask was, um, if Knights of a Promise was adapted, would you want it to be TV, movie, or something else completely like a musical? Um, interpretive dance. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think I think the I think like as you read it, it's quite visual. Mm. I think it would make a great kind of Sunday afternoon BBC, you know, sitting around with the family kind of drama. Uh, but also I know that... Like Box of Delights. Um, people keep, I've heard of Box of Delights, but I've never watched it. So you too young. <laughs> do what Box of Delights is, but more, I guess, like, the, his dark materials... It was in the 80s. So I, I was I born in the 80s, but I don't remember ever watching it. Uh, yeah you might just be a little bit too young I was born in 78 so I was the right age <laughs> um yeah so I think maybe something like that but it's yeah I think it, it was but I'd love a radio drama because I love mm. listening to radio dramas and yeah, I love yeah. the fact that you can um you know you can be you can you can go with it but I think there's so many visual markers in the book um it might be a little bit difficult to without having like a narrative voice over the top that's interesting yeah yeah so rather than like a, a radio drama play uh, it would probably need a, a, some kind of a an external narrator that's describing things right yeah they like the floating boroughs yeah yeah oh fascinating I mean I love a radio drama so that would be that'd be um really sweet my um I was a big Lord of the Rings fan as a kid and um I love Lord of the Rings, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say Tolkien is the greatest writer in the world. <laughs> um, he's the greatest world builder in the world. But um, so I think my favourite version of Lord of the Rings was the um, audio drama version, which had um, Ian Holm playing Frodo, which when the films came around later, it was very confusing because suddenly he was Bilbo. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you're Frodo. <laughs> um, and uh, one thing I didn't work out till years later was there was, um, you know, you kind of, I listened to them a lot of times so I knew the cast list off by heart and it was uh, and William Nighy and he, only years later did I realize that's Bill Nighy <laughs> yeah and he's playing Sam yeah so. oh that's cool yeah, yeah. Was, I bet he was a great Sam 
he was great he was amazing but like did not make the connection you know saw loads of films with him in and then was like oh wait a minute William Bill William uh, yeah yeah so who are you interviewing next um I am interviewing Anna next uh, I've got her book here hang on let me grab it oh. the rapids oh cool so that's cool I haven't started reading it yet so I'm gonna have to uh that, stop stop well, tomorrow <laughs> sorry I missed that bit you're it was very fresh in your mind by the time it you will be yeah um as I said earlier I've, I've got a bit of a rubbish memory for quite a lot of things but story seems to stick in my brain um good. so I'm quite lucky with that <laughs> which is yeah. good when I throw my story away and then start again yeah 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 I think that's the only way to <laughs> you require a memory um yes I think I remember the like structure of story in the bigger sense but not necessarily the details of what happens in any individual story <laughs> yeah but I think um, sometimes if if like especially when it's your own story if you've lost those details then those details were not important they were not the thing that was resonating through your story they were not the mm. thing that was important and holding it together and that you needed for you know for the development if it's something that you can... I think I I would very much come up from the point of view of like every story has a million versions and it doesn't really matter which version you tell as long as it's a good version like story a bit like myth and so that kind of um I could tell this story a million ways there's no one right way to tell it it's just you know I will find a particular way that I'm enjoying and follow that one yeah although I think sometimes like when you have like versions of fairy tales there's always like the version you like the best you know so yeah like, yeah for me the little mermaid it has to be like the original Hans Christian Hansen version right. I don't you know Disney version I like yeah. the fact that always it's got to be the Roald Dahl revolting rhymes versions for me <laughs> and anything where you got Red, Red Riding Hood with a gun is good and knitters. yeah that yes um, indeed when you go and back to the original originals they're horrific they are um uh, sleeping beauty especially i can't even put it on video it's too horrible um and, and but, i yeah. quite like uh neil gaiman's kind of perception of sleeping beauty that she's a vampire <laughs> how many <laughs> how many women do you know with lips as red as red as blood and who are very uh, pale and have dark yeah. hair and um go to sleep and then die and wake up yeah <laughs> that's fun yeah i like vampires i mean i like vampires in anything they can they can turn up whenever they like i will welcome i will invite them in quick you heard that everyone <laughs> <laughs> oh god that just worked didn't it so yeah were, it might have done then <laughs> quick retract yeah, it can you retract does that work i'll invite uh, them quick some kind of spell i think uh, just i'll do the spell after the video it's fine. okay excellent find some salt um, wiggle that about well, yeah. vampires and slugs so yeah just... it's very similar um so before we go i feel like i should put one little guest star on camera um and if i can work it out there we are there's oh, buffy there's buffy sleeping her way through the interview um, but she yeah. says hi what she would do if she was awake <laughs> Perfect. well thank you ever so much it was it was really good fun i really enjoyed it and and you're recording this right so yeah i'm recording this so um i shall send it off to the to the fairies Fantastic. yeah brilliant the fairies the mysterious figures the mysterious figures i'll send it yeah. to kitty and i'll be like here you go yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do what you do my lovely <laughs> yeah Bless awesome me. she's amazing putting everything yeah. together and no yeah, she's just she's a powerhouse she's on fire and a very good writer as well so oh Oh, okay right have a lovely oh, evening oh yes, sorry <laughs> i'll just i'll just that was my summary of, of hers which is um the power meets why last man that's a good x meets y mm -hmm. yeah definitely. and yeah it's a fantastic book anyway a lovely to speak to you um and i look forward to seeing whatever interview you do next with her yeah it'll be fun once i've read the book yeah. obviously no pressure yeah. just get it ready yeah, <laughs> yeah. stop <laughs> Got this interview, read. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm doing. Well, straight after I've eaten, I'm then going to read. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, take care. Have a lovely evening. Okay. 
Hi, I hope you really enjoyed that chat. Next week, Annalise is going to be talking to Anna Bowles, whose debut Rapids is uh, out this uh, year with Zun Told, and it's um, a story of friendship and mental health, and I really hope to see you there. Bye for now. One, two, three.